Mark P. Otten back with you. All right, this is the other stuff you should know about structural equation modeling. Um, this is sort of, uh, I guess, the last video that you need to watch if you are running a conventional structural equation model with um, continuous variables and um, uh, well-behaved non-well-behaved norm, uh, normally distributed variables. If you get through this video, you should be okay. Uh, and then toward the second half of the video, we're going to talk about uh, what happens when you have a dichotomous or categorical dependent variable. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about what happens if you have non-normal data. And so we'll start in with some of the special cases of SEM uh, in that sense. And then I will declare you guys ready to run your own SEM. Uh, uh, the rest of, of uh, these videos uh, will be designed for other special cases of SEMs, like uh, when you have interactions between variables or um, we're going to talk about latent growth curve models later. So anyway, um, this is the other stuff you should know in particular. Um, uh, the things that uh, might supplement your um, SEM maybe that you've already run, a, co a confirmatory factor analysis or a path analysis, for example. And then also in here is going to be some of the um, very exciting uh, other fit indices, uh, other ways you can evaluate your model fit uh, once you're done running it. So. Okay, so we're going to go back to the anxiety example. We're not going to revisit the skiing example this time. Uh, we're moving back to this one. Uh, this was um, a subset of a real uh, model that I ran in my research in the past, which predicted basketball performance based on <clears throat> three anxiety indicators um, or three anxiety predictors. Um, each of those predictors was a factor made up of three items. Uh, they were all also co uh, correlated with each other or allowed to correlate with each other. Um, the cor correlations between self-confidence and the two other anxiety factors were hypothesized to be negative. Um, and then in turn, uh, that confidence variable was predicted to um, uh, lead to better basketball performance, while the anxiety variables were predicted to lead to worse basketball performance. Performance was also measured three ways. So each of these were uh, factors or latent variables composing a nice, tidy little SEM here. Okay. So here's your uh, map of stars and such, uh, the, the parameters that we're estimating here. Uh, I set um, the uh, first loading of each factor uh, to one for each of our four uh, factors. So I'm not uh, fixing any variances here. Um, I'm just trying to be consistent to, to, um, to keep this thing straight. Um, all those correlations there are two-way arrows with stars uh, to represent the estimated correlations that are gonna come out. And then uh, we have a bunch of factor loadings, uh, and we also have a bunch of errors that uh, will be estimated here. Okay, so we, we specify this in, in our chosen computer program, um, uh, such as R, uh, and then R will do the work for us. Uh, in previous videos, I showed you what the setup is, um, or at least uh, showed you some of the details of what, what happens uh, when, when you plug in a model and run it. Um, the Bettler Weeks model will be specified. Uh, this will all be done secretly by R um, uh, based on the equations that you set up. So it will specify the Bentley Weeks model. It will multiply the matrices together uh, creatively to get the estimated covariance matrix uh, based on your model. Um, so that was what we covered in the last video. Um, then it, then uh, maximum likelihood is used, but that's the default method anyway, uh, to minimize the differences between the model covariance matrix and the actual data covariance matrix. Um, so it's a two-step process where those matrices that you set up then get uh, start values plugged in, they're multiplied together, and then this, that's the first step. And then the second step is to um, iterate that solution or minimize the differences as closely, bring our, our model as close as we can mathematically to uh, the actual data uh, covariance matrix. Um, then we have an estimated covariance matrix for the model that is finalized. Parameter estimates get plugged into the model. Um, it all, the R runs this in usually less than one second. Okay, magic. All of the, the star values have turned into numbers here. Thanks to R. Uh, you can um, refer to my R video, my separate video on how to type in the right code to get all these numbers to come through. Um, but uh, this is what it looks like. And then uh, typically in our diagrams when we uh, put these on posters or um, uh, in uh, journal articles uh, is we uh, put the stars next to the values that came out significant. In this case, uh, 
you might notice that some of the factor loadings don't get stars. Those are just the ones that we had originally set to one for the iterative process, so they don't get significance tested by R. But everything else does, and uh, when you're looking in the uh, R output, you'll see the value in the standardized uh, value column, and then you'll see a p-value associated with it, and if that p-value is less than 0.05, then you can go ahead and safely put a star on there. So. Uh, you see all of the error or residual values out there on the side. The uh, factor loadings basically are all significant here. Um, and then if you look at the regressions, you've got one out of three significant. F2, that's, uh, what is that? That's confidence leading to basketball performance with a uh, 0.46 significant value. The other two, the anxiety variables 0.24 and negative 0.15 were both non-significant. And that's it. that turned out to be very interesting for my research because there was not a significant relationship between anxiety and performance. That meant that for some folks, anxiety was a bad thing. For other folks, anxiety was a good thing. <laughs> so that was actually a cool, for me, a cool non-significant result. Uh, and then you see the three correlations there. There were relationships, uh, significant relationships between all three of our predictor latent variables, F1, F2, F3, especially F1 with F3, those are the two anxiety latent variables correlating at 0.84. Uh, R is also giving you your chi-square test and your fit statistics. So you can use this uh, model. I'm not gonna give you the degrees of freedom here or how they were calculated um, specifically. Well, you'll get the degrees of freedom, but you won't get how they were calculated. And so you can try that on your own and try to get, uh, well, am I giving you the degrees of freedom? Maybe I'm not, oh, I'm not. Okay, yeah, so practice that if you, <laughs> if you want to try to run run by me how uh, how that goes. But that's covered in a previous video. The chi-square test rejects the model here, 0 0.01 or less than 0 0.01. Uh, and so that suggests poor fit. However, the comparative fit index and root mean square error of approximation are both pretty solid, uh, I will tell you. So uh, mixed results here for this model. Um, but uh, usually the chi-square test does turn up a rejection. So in this case, we can say, yeah, there's, there's some support for the model. Okay, so this is the new stuff. Um, and so um, uh, we have a lot of recommendations for what to do next uh, that have come through the literature over the years. Um, the first one, and this is pretty standard, um, this is the one that uh, is, I would be remiss to not recommend doing this every time uh, when you do an SEM, and that is running post hoc tests. So uh, if you have done an ANOVA before, you may have followed up with post hoc t-tests or um, the Tukey and Shafe tests. This is SEM's version of that. And so um, the uh, suggestion over the years has been to consider adding paths first. Uh, those would be post hoc additions. And then second, uh, see if we should delete any bad ones or paths, uh, relationships between variables that failed. Um, so what is, is, uh, is suggested here is um, uh, overall, adding paths first, subtracting paths second, but the fewer modifications, the better. And that's because if you add a path in particular, um, you need to justify it based on some hypothesis. So we're still trying to keep the scientific method in mind. Adding paths wildly without any justification is tempting because it may boost your model fit. And actually, if you're adding these paths, what, uh, what R will give you is a list of suggested modifications mathematically that have nothing to do with theory. And so then your job is to assess them, go back and see if a uh, connection between uh, two of these variables or um, maybe it involves an error variance or something like this. If that connection makes sense based on your prior theory, then you include a citation uh, when you add it. Um, you have to include some justification, otherwise um, the reviewers of your uh, paper or your poster will be questioning you about it. Um, and you can't just say it was the Lagrange test um, that, that you followed, uh, even though it is the Lagrange test, that you, the Lagrange multiplier test, as it were, um, that you followed. So this is the mathematical mechanism for uncovering these potential additions. Um, uh, and so, like I said, R is going to give you a list. It's kind of like uh, this, the analogy here is like a stepwise regression that you may have run in the past, where you um, you have your model. And then you have a list of stuff, list of relationships between variables that were, were not originally in the model. And then you allow the computer to suggest, okay, this is the strongest relationship that is missing. 
uh, from your model. If you improve, if you add this in, the covariance matrix for your model is going to uh, is going to come closer to your actual data covariance matrix, and it's going to list the one that's the strongest difference first. Um, I don't know if Joseph Louis Lagrange ever imagined that his test would be <laughs> applied in this setting because SEM came much later. So don't confuse with Lagrange with some SEM theorist, but um, but it's a it's a process similar to regression wherein you can add paths, add relationships, add statistical um, lines of equations to um, to test them one by one. Um, so that's what happens here. With each suggestion you get a, here's what would happen to your chi-square if you add this in. Uh, and the degrees of freedom will change by one each time. So um, for the, the chi-square then you can get a different score. You can get like chi-square before and after. And so then the first thing in your list is going to have that chi-square listed next to it or that, that, um, that change in chi-square listed next to it. So in this case, if you run this through R, uh, you're going to, this, for this example, you're going to get V11 uh, as a factor loading suggested to go to F1. So let's go back to the model here if we can. Okay, so here we go. This is our original model. Let's go back to the, let's go back even further. Uh, V11 with F1. Okay, so V11 was a basketball performance variable, right? That was performance two was V11. F1, what was F1? F1 was cognitive anxiety. So what we're seeing here is a suggestion of a particular performance variable that is suggested to correlate with cognitive anxiety, or not, not just correlate with it, but actually uh, it's suggested to be a fourth element of it. Uh, the computer is saying, hey, we should add in this performance variable and include it as part of cognitive anxiety. So in this case, uh, we would go, go back and actually look at what that performance variable was, but I can tell you that um, a measurement of basketball performance is not going to be an appropriate uh, element of anxiety because anxiety is not necessarily specific to basketball in this case. So, so the answer to this question probably in this case would be no. This does not make sense. And so even though it would improve the model, uh, it, uh, it doesn't make sense. And so we can't really do it um, unless we have some, some sort of citation to say, oh, someone who performs basketball in this way is going to be more anxious automatically or is going to be more anxious um, uh, generally. So so uh, we would reject this one. Then we would go on to the next one and we would see if the next one um, uh, makes sense and so on. Uh, oops, I just went on to the to the next part. I, that was an accident. Okay, uh, Okay. so as you go down the list of possible modifications that are uh, as part of the output from R, you're going to note or you're going to need to note 3.84 which is the critical value for a chi-square distribution with one degree of freedom which is like when you're adding a path, you're changing the, uh, the um, chi-square for the model by one degree of, uh, degree of freedom by one. <laughs> and so if a, uh, I think R denotes it as an MI, modification index, if that value is greater than 3.84, then you should consider it. Uh, if it's not, then you shouldn't. And it's not significantly improving the model if it's not greater than 3.84, at least by this criteria, the conventional criteria. So. For this particular model, I think there's like 10 different paths. If you're going down that are all clear of 3.84, you should consider each one in turn to see if it makes sense. And if you do add one, then you need to restart the process, like add it and then go again and then see, because the numbers will change slightly now that that new path is added. So suppose you add three paths, you add one that was like fourth on the list because, hey, it makes sense. Then you, you re redo the model, you redo the the LM test and you see what is left after that and so on until you're done and you've either rejected these uh, added paths because they don't make sense or because they're not uh, the modification index listed is not greater than 3.84. Okay so this is what I almost showed you a minute ago. Uh, the wall test is step two. Again it's a um, it's a it's a test named after a mathematician from the past that had no idea that his stuff would be someday applied to structural equation modeling. Can you imagine you like you're Abraham Wald, and you're like, all right, I'm going to develop this test, and then like, I don't know, 35 years later, after you've already passed on, uh, your test gets picked up in a new context. That, that would be pretty cool. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, again, the Wald test, not, nothing specific to SEM, but when applied to SEM is the test for dropping equations from the situation and testing that drop to see what happens, to see if there's a significant 
change. So we, again, we have a different score uh, of chi-squares, uh, but the before and after of the chi-square uh, statistic with one degree of freedom is run again here. The key here is we're not actually improving our model anymore. We cannot improve our model by dropping anything, but what we can do is we can test to see if, let's say we drop something, is there a significant drop in model fit? Do, do we make the model worse if this path is dropped? And if not, if we're not making things worse by dropping the model, uh, dropping the, the relationship, then we should go ahead and drop it because then uh, we're achieving something called parsimony, uh, which is a fancy way of saying we want to make the model as uh, small as possible. We want to make the, the model um, as succinct, as clear as possible to highlight only the relationships that need to be in there in order to um, illustrate our hypothesis. So, so this is desired. We should drop paths that are not making the model worse. We should just be careful not to drop paths that are not, uh, uh, that, are, that are actually good. Um, okay, so when we run this in R, uh, R is not actually running the wall test technically. We just kind of have to get it working backwards. So what I mean by that is we go to our model and we look through all of the paths, factor loadings, regressions, yeah, leave out the residual or error value uh, variances. Just look at the factor loadings and the regressions and the correlations, those three, and try to figure out which one is least significant and then drop it and see what happens. So for our model, the relationship between somatic anxiety and performance was the negative 0.15, and that value was the least significant among all of those values. So what you do is you, you take that one, you drop it from the model, and then you go and see what happens to the chi-square. And if the chi-square changes a whole bunch, in fact, if it changes more uh, by, a, by a value greater than 3.84, that critical value that I was just showing you, then your model is changing a lot, and it's probably not good to drop the, the path. But if you change it and it's like the chi-square changes like 0 0.5 or whatever, something less than 3.84, then you're good because you're dropping it. There's not much of an effect chi-square is not getting worse. That's your criteria, and then you would go on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and see like if dropping additional paths uh, is possible. So you start with the least significant of all of your factor loadings, regression coefficients, and correlation coefficients as part of your model. You drop one. If it does not have a significant impact on the chi-square, then you go to the next one, and so on, until you run out of potential non-significant paths. Okay, so uh, what do we do here? Uh, what are our guidelines? I've mentioned these a little bit along the way. Um, the first uh, guideline, so these, these are not like, um, you should never do this. Uh, you should hesitate before doing it. I've, I've had students interpret this slide as like, you should never add a cross-loading. You should never drop an error variance. Well, you can. Uh, you, it's, a, it's another thing where you want to include a little bit of justification each time. Uh, so you should hesitate. Think about it, and then do it, and then justify it, um, if it makes sense. So a cross-loading, what is that? That's, a, that's one of those uh, first suggestions that we had, which was to add, like, V11, the basketball performance item, onto, I think it was F1, um, as a, as a, adding a basketball performance item to the, it would be, then be uh, an element of F4, but it would also be an element of F1, right? So that's a cross-loading. It's loading across more than one factor. Um, and so, yes, hesitate before doing that. In this case, we rejected that because it doesn't make sense to have a performance variable uh, as an element of anxiety, but sometimes maybe it would. Like, for example, if one of the cognitive anxiety items cross-loaded onto somatic anxiety, let's say. They're different things, but they're definitely related, so maybe a cross-loading makes more sense there, and you could do it. Um, generally, if you're suggested to have a cross-loading like we were, it will improve the model if you add it, um, uh, if it's suggested that way by the, the Lagrange multiplier test anyway. Um, so uh, you can add it, but you just have to hesitate uh, first and, and, and justify it uh, if you do. So also, uh, as I mentioned, adding any paths that can't be theoretically justified, uh, should, you should definitely hesitate before doing that. Um, and then also dropping any error variances, that's kind of a weird one that would assume that uh, there is no error associated with a variable, which means that your variable is exactly um, uh, represented by your factor. Um, so uh, uh, that's unusual. 
Uh, you could try you could try to uh, justify that though as well, um, and I've seen it done before uh, successfully. So again, these are not rules; these are guidelines um, and recommendations uh, from the literature. Okay, so that's your post hoc test lesson. Moving on to model identification. This is sort of like um, just some guidelines for data screening that we probably could have gone over at the beginning before starting SEM, um, uh, but these are unique uh, data screening items for SEM that um, are often fine, uh, even if you don't check them. Um, so this is just kind of like assumptions, this checklist of assumptions uh, that you should know exist, and you should also double check your model before running it in real life. So um, a model is identified if there is a unique numerical solution for it and for each of the parameters therein. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that the computer will balk and give you an error message if this is not fulfilled. Uh, but there's some criteria here as far as what makes a model identify. So we'll go through each of these briefly uh, in turn. The first one being um, that degrees of freedom are greater than zero. Um, if your uh, degrees of freedom are greater than zero, basically it just means that you are not trying to do too much with too little. Um, so what that means is if you think back to your degrees of freedom formula, uh, you're taking your number of measured variables in that first term and subtracting out uh, the number of parameters that you're estimating. So if you're estimating too many things based on how many measured variables you have, then you're going to drive your degrees of freedom below zero, um, and then the computer will not run your model. Um, so you, what you want is an over-identified model, uh, one that is um, properly set up with uh, a uh, appropriate number of parameters. Um, there's a special case of when the degrees of freedom equals zero. In that case, some of your um, fit statistics will work and some of them won't. Um, uh, in particular, your estimated covariance matrix will not be um, set up. Uh, it'll actually match your data covariance matrix, which doesn't really make sense in order to assess model fit, so then it's kind of weird. Okay, so the second criteria for um, model identification is um, well, so basically I, I already told you about uh, how we fix a loading to one or we fix the uh, variance of a factor to one. Uh, so based on that, in terms of the measurement model, um, we have some criteria here. So I mentioned also that having at least three measured variables per factor um, is a good uh, thing. So that will guarantee model identification in this way or uh, by this, these criteria. Um, you also have uh, errors that are uncorrelated with each other to start. Um, correlating errors means that there might be some unique relationship between, let's say, V1 and V2. Aside from their common variance that they share with F1, those kinds of hypotheses are possible but unusual. Um, so if the errors start out uncorrelated, that's um, conventional uh, in this case, as is having at least three measured variables for your factor. Um, so that's, those are the conventional ways to declare your, your measurement model or your measured variables um, as identified as part of an SEM. Uh, then there's some additional criteria here. You can double check. My, my uh, disclaimer is that usually these are in place. So like uh, most of our SEM examples will have this, uh, these characteristics already. Um, but the skiing example, for, exa for instance, did not have... Uh, at least three measured variables per factor. That was because it was a small sample and a small um, model uh, for the purposes of a class example. So um, in real life, there may exist some of these combinations. Um, so we should keep an eye out for it. Okay, so what else? If there are two or more factors in your model, which there often are, um, and each factor has three or more indicators, which is recommended, then we mentioned errors should be uncorrelated. Each indicator also loads onto one factor, meaning there are no cross loadings that we talked about a, a couple minutes ago. And then also factors are allowed to co-vary, meaning we don't have a orthogonal type of model here where factors are independent of each other and fixed to and those correlations or covariances are fixed to zero. So that's again conventional um, and will come by default uh, in your R package uh, when you set this stuff up. Okay, uh, this is what happens. You, you add in an additional criteria here when you have only two indicators of a factor or two measured variables for a particular factor, and that is the last one there. In addition to uncorrelated errors and no cross loadings, you also have uh, the criteria that none of the variances or covariances among factors should be zero, which would be weird if they were. Uh, but again, that's similar to um, allowing the factors to covary, because if they do, then the, their covariances are not zero.
and neither are their variances. So if you have a factor that has a zero variance, that's weird anyway. So anyway, this is sort of the fine print. Like I said, it's uh, assumptions that need to be in place for your SEM, and so we should cover these. Um, the last one here is the recursive uh, rule. So a non-recursive relationship um, is a weird one uh, and should be avoided. So that's what the non-recursive relationship there is where it is, sometimes this happens by accident, um, but I've, I've rarely seen this in literature. Maybe it's always caught before uh, studies are published, but basically just be careful not to predict F5 from F4 and then somewhere else predict F4 from F5 as part of like a re regression that, I mean, there's a lot of different regressions sometimes in SEM models, so you just have to make sure that you don't have one direction, uh, one um, prediction going one way, that, and then it leads back the same direction, eventually going back the other way, because uh, that would make that would screw up the math essentially. Um, so you you want relationships where you predict one variable from the other and not the reverse. Um, the other alternative here would be to correlate F4 and F5. So you could set that up as a two-way arrow as a correlation, and that's fine too, uh, as long as you just uh, avoid the regression going one way and then turning around and the regression going the other way again. Okay, so besides some of this unique stuff uh, to SEM, we also have some non-unique stuff, and that is the usual rules of thumb for univariate, multivariate normality apply. You guys have been applying these in your examples, uh, your path analysis and uh, confirmatory factor analysis examples, and we can carry these forward as well. Um, Okay, so what about the case where you have some non-normality in there and you don't want to just scrap your SEM or kick out those variables? You want to try to keep them in, uh, so what do you do? Well, um, uh, this, there's a test statistic uh, that allows you to keep your model exactly intact and just report uh, something in addition. Um, this is a, uh, one that came from Peter Bentler and uh, Albert Satora, who is still a professor uh, in Spain. Uh, they work together, I don't know, probably the 1980s to come up with this, um, which was an adjustment to the chi-square test statistic that is familiar that allows for greater non-normality. If you're curious about how it does that, um, just take a look at the formula and then you can also read up on uh, literature written by Satora and Bentler. Um, but it's sort of like a scaled or um, uh, adjusted chi-square test. Um, so uh, if you ask it to, R will report this as well. Um, it will report the standard errors that are um, slightly edited to adjust for non-normality as well as the Satora Bentler um, scaled chi-square test statistic. So what should you do? do? Are these standard errors really necessary? Well, in practice what I've seen most often and what is recommended um, by the authorities most often is to just report the Satora Bentler scaled chi-square test statistic in addition to the regular uh, chi-square test statistic. Um, and you should be okay. So the, the reason for that is because some of this non-normality is built into the adjustment that is made. Um, and again, if you want more info on that adjustment, um, feel free to uh, take a look at the literature. Um, but meanwhile, you'll also have like a p-value associated with it. So maybe um, your original chi-square test statistics suggested a lack of model fit, but then you knew you had a couple of non-normal variables in there. So you ran the Satora Bentler one and actually it came out better or something like that because it detected that non-normality and didn't attribute lack of fit to that. Uh, that might happen. Um, in my experience, I mean, you can always report the Satora Bentler uh, statistic actually, uh, but in my experience, if you don't have stuff that's particularly non-normal, then it will come out to be very close to the original chi-square test statistic. So, so you can play around with that if you'd like. Uh, apply this to different examples and see how it differs to, uh, from the original chi-square test statistic. So that was, that's one strategy there uh, for non-normality besides the usual checks and um, outlier detection and things like that. What about sample size? So I think maybe in class I said you needed to have like at least 300 people, but then in the notes here and in the textbook it's actually 500 people or more that you need um, based on maximum likelihood, based on that process of um, uh, uh, getting your uh, model uh, covariance matrix estimated. So like the more people the better in the sense that those correlations and those betas and those factor learning, all those things become more stable, right? You don't, if you add in an outlier and you have 500 people, that outlier is not going to swing things too much. And so then uh, since you're estimating so many things, you add in that outlier, it might swing a lot of things so in order for to protect against that, you want a bigger sample size. 
if that makes sense. Well, that's what the textbooks recommend. Generally, the more parameters you estimate as part of your model, the larger sample you need. But then we have me, a mediocre researcher, and I published this 2009, 67 parameters in my massive SEM and 201 people, which works out to about three people per parameter, which is probably less than, I mean, what, like 10 people per parameter was, that's what some textbooks recommend. Uh, so I, theoretically by that I should have had 670 parameters, or at least more than 500 based on the other textbook recommendation. But this was in the Journal of Sport and Exercise Psychology, and they liked my study so much that they put it in there, even with such a small sample size and such a big model. So it's subjective. Uh, these things are subjective. And I also, I think, um, uh, I also mentioned in class that uh, there are power analyses that you can run. Power analysis is a method where you can plug in like, okay, yes, I have 67 parameters. Um, uh, how many participants do I need? Um, to cover those 67 parameters, and then you would also perhaps specify which ones are betas and which ones are factor loadings and all this stuff, and then plug it in, and, and by that analysis, you might get a, a number out that's that's very specific to your situation. Um, so that's another option, um, but uh, I have rarely been asked to run, a, run one of those, and I certainly was not for this particular study uh, that I did, so I'm stopping short of recommending power analysis for SEM, but if you're curious and you wanted to, if you ever needed to really justify uh, sample size in the future, if your advisor asked you for one, for example, uh, for your thesis, um, either a master's thesis or on into the future PhD thesis, then, you know, you could look up Power Analysis SEM, send me an email, I can help you out with it. All right, moving on. So other stuff you should know. So this is um, this is a, another useful alternative test statistic come up uh, that has um, been come up with, came up, that, how should I say that? K. Hai Yuan at Notre Dame came up with this uh, residual based test statistic. Um, this is, so residuals are, when you're talking about residuals, typically in SEM, you're talking about residuals between the covariance matrix from your data and the covariance matrix uh, implied by your model. So uh, I showed you that matrix in the previous lesson. Uh, it's a residual matrix. So if you come up with a test statistic based on that, it's kind of like coming up with a test statistic similar to the chi-square test, which compares uh, in a different way the um, data covariance matrix and the model covariance matrix. So this one, since it relies only on the residuals and not other things, may be a little bit better uh, as far as holding up well. Uh, they did some simulation studies for small samples uh, to justify this. Again, everybody seems to work with Peter Bentler on these things. so. Uh, K-high did the same thing, um, and so they ran some simulation studies, like I mentioned. That means you can take a model like the one we have in our example and run it as if there were 60 people, run it as if there were 600 people, compare the results. Um, and so in this case, they found that this was pretty consistent um, with some small samples. So uh, we could report that. Uh, basically, again, if you are in a situation where you have an SEM and you are worried about this, you could then just... What's the strategy? The strategy is to report this particular test statistic in addition to the chi-square uh, test statistic. And if it's wildly different than the chi-square test statistic, then that means your sample size might have been pretty small. Um, if not, uh, then your sample size may not be that small. Um, so uh, here are some strategies. So uh, try first of all, try to make your model as parsimonious as possible. This was the word that I used earlier. That means cut it down in advance ideally as far as you can because the more stuff you add the more sample size theoretically you need um, and so on uh, so um, so if you can do that in advance uh, that's good um, and then also like I mentioned report this additional test statistic from K. Hai Yuan and Peter uh, Bentler. Okay so what about discrete data uh, for your SEM? Well uh, if your independent variable is a discrete or categorical variable then well, you don't have to do anything special. Uh, this is also true for multiple aggression in the sense that um, if you have, let's say, two categories, a gender a variable, something like that, uh, you don't have to do anything. Uh, it's, it's general linear model at that point, so a 0, 1, uh, or a 1, 2 IV is okay. If your uh, independent variable is ordinal, like, uh, let's say, uh, high-low or something like that, 
then R may convert to um, correlations instead of covariances here. In particular, polychoric correlations, which is the correlation that uh, deals with uh, a correlation, let's say, between an ordinal variable and another ordinal variable. Um, or a polyserial, which is an ordinal with a regular interval variable. It may detect the, uh, or you might be able to specify as well, uh, if an IV is ordinal like that. But if it's gender, let's say it's something just 0, 1 with no order to it, then you don't have to do anything like I mentioned before. So this is a special case, um, and R will accommodate you either way. Um, uh, if the dependent variable is nominal, it's a little bit more of an issue. Then you're sort of converting to like a logistic fra uh, regression framework where like you're, this is not general linear model anymore because you're just predicting categories at that point. But this is not a logistic SEM. What happens is you specify a dependent variable as nominal, uh, and then uh, R will make it work by converting your variables to factors. So if you're curi curious as to why this works, uh, you can read up on this more. There's more in the textbooks. Um, but again, all you have to do is specify in advance uh, that the, the dependent variable is nominal, and then R will adjust. And so we can uh, help you with that code uh, if you'd like. Um, and so then you just need to remember what Vs are which, which Vs are which, and then they might end up as Fs, but they're actually just measured variables uh, as they were uh, to begin with. So it should be good to go if you just declare it as, D, as a DV in your R code uh, for practical purposes. Okay, so uh, this is the point where we could have stopped, and I think you'd be fine uh, <laughs> to run your SEM and to accommodate non-normality, to accommodate a, a dependent variable that's dichotomous. Well, so in my education, oftentimes I did stop here. However, I did take a class um, in graduate school that was like a was sort of like the CSUN 524 class, but then we did SEM as part of that class as well, and that particular professor decided to go into many more um, fit statistics beyond what I've told you so far just to show us what was possible and what people do, um, what people have come up with over the years as alternatives to the chi-square test statistic and the CFI and the RMSCA. So I encourage you guys to take this with uh, a degree of wonder, like, okay, what is the best way to um, assess your model? Is it by comparing covariance matrices, and if so, what is the best way to compare them, or is it by doing some other comparison? Um, be, uh, cr think critically here as much as you can in order to appreciate the possibilities, um, but at the same time, like, I don't know, all of the ones that I'm going to show you, all these alternative fit statistics I'm going to show you are somewhat similar to each other, so if you have a good fitting model that's pretty consistently good fitting, then all of these uh, indices are going to tell you the same thing, and so they start to become redundant after a while. Same thing with a bad model. You're just going to continue to see the similar res uh, similar result as you go along. So this is, again, this is additional information that I was taught, and I, I guess after I was done learning it, I was like, well, that was interesting, but not really necessary. I probably won't subject my students to this. So I will subject you to it, but only briefly. I'll just give you a summary of these. So. Okay, so what was uh, what, what's the recommendation from the top? The recommendation is to report, in addition to the chi-square, at least the CFI or RMSEA at minimum, and then one other, which we haven't talked about yet. It's a root mean square residual, or a standardized root mean square residual. So let's talk about this first. Um, and this was recommended by Hu and Bentler, 1999. Others maybe not. I don't know, this is sort of like the fourth in line for me after the previously mentioned chi-square, CFI, and RMSEA. So what is, what is this number four um, uh, in line test statistic? Well, it's the, uh, the, the non-standardized one is where we start, and that's the average difference between the elements of the estimated covariance matrix, that's the one from your model, and the actual covariance matrix from your data. So if you take all of the differences between those covariances, and average them together. It's like a mean difference. Um, so that's the, the non-standardized version, and then it's sometimes easier to square, or I'm sorry, to standardize uh, that measure, um, because then it results in a range of 0 to 1, and the criteria is 0 0.08 or less. You want a small RMR, or a small SRMR, um, and so that will suggest good model fit. So uh, similar criteria, actually, to the RMSEA in the end. Um, so again, this is another 
way of comparing your covariance matrices, another similar method. Then we have the uh, Akaike criteria uh, that um, this one is used in and out of SEM. Um, this one you, you might see in other um, applications of statistics. This is a way of comparing models to each other. So in SEM, this is not our first option just because we usually we just specify one model and then we can compare it to, let's say, um, the independence model uh, where all variables are unrelated. This is what we've done in the past, right, uh, for the CFI. Or we can compare it to the perfect model. Well, we've already done some of those comparisons. This will allow you to compare uh, one model to the next, competing models, uh, perhaps. Um, and so there's a formula here that's relatively straightforward. Um, the uh, consistent version of this test statistic is here as well. It accounts for sample size because uh, that's a capital N in there. Um, but what, like this is useful, but like what is wh when would we actually use it? I, I just told you we don't often use it uh, as our first choice in uh, SEM context. Um, so like I said, it's, it's useful when uh, mod in, in comparing models to each other, Maybe we're trying to be parsimonious about it um, in that we're trying to make our model as small as we can while still evalu evaluating our hypothesis. So maybe we have a, a small uh, version of our model and then we have a big version of our model and we want to run both. Um, we could do that and then use the Akaike criteria to um, assess which one is better in that, in that way. Um, but there's no clear criteria here. You're just comparing models to each other. Um, in the chi-square and such. Um, okay, so that's another one. I'm going to fly through these a little bit just because, like I said, this is additional info for you. The stuff you can ask for in R, you'll get these test statistics if you ask for them. Uh, the next one is uh, the bentler bonnet uh, normed fit index. Uh, this was an early one. I think this one um, was popular, I think, in 1980 was created. So that's a little bit early in history for SEM, even though that's only... 1980 doesn't seem that long ago in the history of the world, but um, anyway, this I think came first, this NFI, and it came first before some of the other stuff, uh, such as the CFI, um, I think. Anyway, uh, this is a similar value. It's like a CFI that's just a little bit different. Um, values of 0.95 or greater are appropriate here, and you're using the independence model and the chi-square uh, from the actual model. So if you go back and forth between NFI and CFI, they're just sort of cousins of each other, um, and they're usually going to go along with each other. Okay, and then there's the goodness of fit index, GFI. Uh, this one um, was developed over the years by uh, Stanley Moulek, who is uh, taught at Georgia Tech. Um, so what is this one? This one is the weighted proportion of variance in the actual covariance matrix accounted for by the estimated covariance matrix. This is another comparison of a covariance matrix model to covariance matrix data. Uh, it's a weighted proportion of variance, so it's kind of like an R-squared in the sense that how much of the variance in one is predicted by the variance of the other. So that might have a nice interpretation depending on your opinion. Um, usually uh, in my, uh, in my uh, experience you might see an adjusted or a parsimonious GFI as opposed to the original GFI. Um, it can be adjusted for the number of parameters in your model or the size of your model. And it, um, and so that's what, what happens with these statistics here. So they've been around since about 1989. Okay, so one more thing uh, you should uh, know about here uh, that I'm gonna cover and not really go into detail on, but you should know exists, and that is the original version of the Pentler Weeks model, uh, arguably more complicated, probably more complicated, and that is the uh, Lisserl, L-I-S-R-E-L model, uh, developed by Uriskog, Carl Uriskog, um, who was sort of the father of SEM uh, back in the 60s and 70s. Um, uh, this was, I mean, it's to his credit for having organized all these equations in one place and then allowed Peter Bentler and others to kind of try to simplify the, the model over the years as much as they can. Um, so this broke matrices down into all combinations of measured and latent IVs, measured and latent DVs. So the, the key here is that there were more categories that was further broken down than the Bentler Weeks model was. Um, that is, uh, latent variables and measured variables were separated more cleanly. Um, there's also a Lisserl computer program that, well, you can tell my, my uh, slight resentment for this model. <laughs> I should be thankful that this model exists because nothing else that came after it would if it hadn't come first. But anyway, there was a Lisserl computer program that was uh, 
uh, popular initially. And then uh, I had to learn more about this in grad school. And well, maybe that's why I'm not a big fan. But anyway, uh, there's a little bit more detail in the Tabachnik and Fidel book. Um, here's the gist of it. This is the beta matrix on the left from the Bettler Weeks model. And then you see on the right, the beta matrix is split in half by the Lisserl model into a matrix of um, regression coefficients of latent DVs with other latent DVs, number one. And then number two, uh, uh, measured DVs predicted by latent DVs. And so then those, uh, so there's not the beta matrix anymore. It was now the beta and lambda matrices that make up the beta matrix. Uh, same thing here for gamma. Gamma is now split into gamma and lambda matrices. And again, the criteria is that uh, latent DVs and latent IVs are specified in advance and so then uh, separated out by this model. But uh, if you're curious, you can read more about it again. Uh, but we'll go with the Bettler Weeks model for now because we learned that. I taught you guys that in a previous lesson and because it's slightly simpler. Um, uh, but I guess it would be a good, um, uh, a, a good exercise for you guys to go ahead and, and take a look at the Lisserl model because it really gets at the origins of SEM. And if you're at all curious to be a measurement grad student in the future, looking at the origins of these things and being skeptical of them and why do we use this, this model versus that one or the fit in, this fit in index versus this other one, it's good to look into this stuff a little bit more because we're just sort of scratching the surface of it here. The final distinction uh, here is the phi matrix. The phi matrix gets split into phi psi, theta delta, and theta epsilon. Uh, and again, it's because latent variables and uh, measured variables are separated out in these ways. So anyway, take a look, see what you think, uh, and feel free to put it aside for the purposes of this class.